thinking about what are the values of those changes that are happening, what are consequences of our uh, social behaviors. So the social side of social web applications like blogs, wikis, social bookmarking, instant messaging, social networking, crowdsourcing, and so on. So I will focus mostly on computational aspects, with some reflections on social or human aspects, because those two are actually defined, those two are dependent on each other. I go to slide six. So in the beginning, the computer was purely computational or calculational device used to calculate functions. And as time went by, more and more the communi communication part of computation has become prominent or important. So it started with sharing scientific results, but then it spread to all sorts of social communication in bigger groups, as the internet started as a scientific communication means at CERN. And then today it connects people from all over the world. So we have global ethics of communication based on computing. So the character of computer is very much different from what was in the beginning when the pioneers of computing like Turing, Alan Turing, uh, started to work on this modeling of computing and understanding what computing is. Computing today is much more than just calculating function. So on this next slide, number seven, we can say already Turing had an idea that for intelligence, communication is very important. So he was talking about uh, unorganized systems, or un unorganized computers, which were the predecessors of, of the neural networks or network computing. So he has understood that for learning, it is very important to share information among uh, agents. So this sharing part comes through communication. So in social computing, we have elements of social intelligence as this communicative part or sharing of information is essential for intelligence, both for brains and for social intelligence. So the next slide, number eight, the conceptual basis of this understanding is network model. And it's interesting that we'll find networks in nature on many different levels of organization. So we'll find evolutionary networks, uh, human neural networks, protein interactions, networks, social networks, and so on. And what is interesting is to see the general characteristics of different sorts of networks. People are starting to realize that there are common laws that we can find in all sorts of networks. So this can help us to understand the behavior of groups of agents, like social uh, social groups, or groups of molecules, or groups of neurons, or whatever groups we have that consist or, or constitute a network. So on the next slide, number nine, I have an illustration of human groups as information processing networks and knowledge generators. We have in sciences, it's very typical, scientific communities who share knowledge and information. And also in social groups, in social media, we share also some other types of information. So it's very important model 
of network behind knowledge generation and intelligence as well. So we can say that networks, they form networks as well. So we have complex structures of networks of networks. And in a complex system, what we see of the system is dependent on where it can happen. So they, there is a difference between what we can observe from the system if we are on the level of atom or if we are on the level of society. Sorts of messages or probes that we use to, to study atoms is completely different from the sorts of messages or probes that we are using to understand society. So, so this result of our research is dependent on the observer, on the agent who is uh, interacting with the system. That's the, 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 the basis of, of complex systems. You, you will find many layers of organization depending on in which way you interact with the system. So in order to understand complex systems, we have basically two possibilities. One is to describe the behaviors, different aspects of behaviors. And the other is what Wolfram called a new kind of science, is generative model. So we assume that we have some simple mechanism that can generate the behavior and emergent properties of the system. So he starts with cellular automata, building more and more complex systems. So you, you can see in his a new kind of science, patterns on shells or patterns of, of leaves and such, uh, similar natural patterns emerging from simple rules for cellular automata. So those are generative models used to generate complex behaviors. One of the most important mechanisms or processes that we know, complex processes, that are very good for modeling with generative models is evolution. We are far from understanding all the details of how evolution works, but it is obvious that generative models are working in evolution. So the slide 11. There is a definition of complex systems from Encyclopedia of Complexity and System Sciences, which says that systems that comprise many interacting parts with ability to generate a new quality of collective behavior through self-organization, and this self-organization is the result of interactions. For example, the spontaneous formation of temporal, spatial, or functional structures. They are therefore adaptive as they evolve and may contain self-prime feedback loops. Thus, complex systems are much more than the sum of their parts. And the difference is exactly the interaction, the strong interaction between different parts. So I move to the next slide. And thinking about social networks as complex systems. They are structures of nodes, which in general could be individuals or groups interacting with each other, they interdependent of the, each other, and they share values, visions, information, ideas, financial means, and so on. So this idea of social networks could, could be used to study many different phenomena in society. The next slide. One of 
the important aspects of social networks is dynamics of networks, the time behavior, how this interaction between different parts uh, develops in time. So there are models, computational models today, which can be used to study even time behavior of social systems. As I mentioned in the beginning, we are studying networks, hoping to learn general laws or general behaviors or patterns of behavior in networks. And very instructive results come from the lab of Laszlo Barabashi. He is basically a physicist. And he also, as many other people, active in the study of, of uh, networks. And uh, two of his books that are books that I can recommend you strongly, which are non-technical books, but give you a very good idea about what, what is important, why do we study uh, networks, are both linked and first. So very often we imagine that we are very special as individuals and we make decisions on a very personal basis. But nevertheless, if you study the big groups of people, you will find regularities. And then striking regularities. I, I can recommend you videos with lectures of Laszlo Barabashi, where he uh, explains very pedagogically this uh, uh, surprising uh, features of, of uh, social networks that exhibit such enormous regularity in spite of all of us believing that we are very unique and, and we make always different uh, decisions. So I will mention on the uh, page 15 that there are some characteristics of complex networks which are very important, like self-similarity. And uh, the reference is given on page 15 to the work which shows that different sorts of real-world systems like World Wide Web, the Internet, energy landscapes, biological systems, social networks, many other systems exhibit uh, scale-free behavior because of power law distribution of the number of links per node. So surprisingly, we find common behavior in very different sorts of real life uh, physical systems, technological or natural systems. On the uh, slide 16, page 16. So, so we talk about self-similarity of complex networks. So contrary to the belief uh, of, or, or in, intuitive picture of networks, we find that uh, uh, networks consist of self-repeating patterns on all length scales. And you know fractal, fractal is a structure which repeats on different scales, the same form on different scales. So you will find many structures in networks. On the next page, 17, there is a work uh, studying fractality in the growth of complex networks. So those are the new uh, results, very, very great results, uh, telling us that we can hope for much more of knowledge of patterns or rules of behavior in complex networks. So one of those uh, regularities that is uh, discovered newly is a strong effective repulsion between the most connected nodes in the network. So though they are distributed far from each other as far as possible or dispersed in the network. And as I mentioned, the necessity of fractal uh, geometry 
is a new creature that, that is very new. So in general, network suggests a model we are now in on the patient IT. Uh, suggests a model where we have nodes which are agents and those are entities able to act on their own and those agents interact within the network. So an agent-based model is a computational model for simulating the actions and interactions of autonomous individuals in the network with a view to assessing their effects on the system as a whole. So with this model, we can get emerging properties based on interactions and features of um, autonomous agents. They are very useful models, and I have some links to further references if you want to learn more about agent-based models. Those models are <coughs> um, something that is quite uh, useful in many different fields where you have a number of uh, autonomous entities that interact. You, you can see them in the biology, especially in the bioinformatics. You can find them in the immunology, in medicine, in economy, ecology, and so on. So you can you can model classes of agents or individual agents with specific properties and then see how they develop through the interactions and what consequences you will get if you change some parameters, if you if you change some properties of agents or if you change the way the community reach if you reach out. We are on the page 21. So we talk about simulations, which are a representation of the results of those models. So through simulation, you can graphically see how your model is behaving and what you get as a result of time development, or time unfolding of a system of agents. So when we look at social aspects or social side of computing, human aspects, uh, we, we can say that this is radically changing the way we of uh, knowledge sharing and information sharing globally. So, There, there are results that from 1998 by Dunbar, which, which uh, uh, suggested that one individual typically has 150 connections with other individuals. But nowadays, with the social media and those computational possibilities that we have, many people have many more connections than that. And of course, as our resources are limited and our rationality is also bounded, the, the question is, what is the result of this sharing much smaller amounts of information with much bigger uh, number of, of others? Of course, it could be uh, the, the same amount of information to all of the agents, but we have different levels of uh, closeness to, to different agents. So we do not uh, discuss very personal things in a very broad network. So there must be a, an effect on our uh, sociality and on our uh, general behaviors if we spend a lot more time today building long-range, long-distance, connections than in, in building a short distance connections as it was the case before. 
So we are, we are witnessing the emergence of global informational networks, even in our private lives. So as, uh, as already Turing uh, noted that sharing of information is the, the essence of intelligence. We can say we can see the beginning of social intelligence, global social intelligence, developing through, um, through communication of information and knowledge globally. So the global awareness of different sorts of problems um, is much more acute today than it was before social media time. And this could be interesting to see this development. Ancient based uh, models are very uh, suitable to analyze such sorts of uh, changes. So starting with a small group sharing knowledge and information and then going to much bigger groups and studying what sorts of information could be shared, what results would be that, what kind of social intelligence can be called for. So on the page 24, the emergence of social institutions from individual interactions. That's also one thing that could be studied by agent-based models. How, um, how social institutions emerge and how they behave. And that's the first time in history that we have a possibility to experimentally, really experimentally study social groups. So as we cannot perform large social experiments in real life, we can try to make models which are representative enough for social groups and their behaviors and study what will be the consequence of some intervention or some change in, in the social system. One of the aspects of social, social aspects of social computing is crowdsourcing. So it's, it's, it's also something very new. There is a definition for crowdsourcing. It is the practice of obtaining needed services ideas or content by obtaining contributions from a large group of people and especially from an online community rather than from traditional employees or suppliers. So sometimes people are searching for uh, funding for their research through crowdsourcing. This is something like new. Also mathematicians are using crowdsourcing for proving theorems, hundreds of mathematicians proving uh, the common theorem through crowdsourcing. So it's a very interesting new phenomenon. On the next page, 26, uh, there are some thoughts about computational modeling for social behaviors. So now it is the focus on computational instead of social. Uh, we are using those uh, agent-based models specifically to address social networks. They can be used to design distributed and hybrid systems. Sometimes they are used to develop understanding of the behavior like philosophical theory or understanding of specific particular social facts or answering social issues by modeling and simulation. So on the next page, the examples nowadays using this approach is constructing complex computational systems composed by agents which are regulated by various types of norms or behaviors, behaviors like um, human social systems or ecosystems and so on. Now we have 
special interlude, which is the part talking about information, computation, and cognition. So when we talk about modeling social systems and using computation for this modeling, one can ask what kind of computation, how could we ever hope to be able to model social or human systems with computational means? If we understand computation as calculation of a function, then it is, of course, hard to imagine that we can uh, describe all complexity of the behaviors by functions. They, they, they are becoming very uh, difficult and difficult to interpret and difficult to calculate. So, my suggestion or my, my approach is that we connect the ideas of information, computation, and cognition. Connect them together to understand complex systems. And I have an example on the on this page 29, which shows current very new uh, projects on uh, research on brain, where brain is modeled on different levels from molecular level, which you can see from the picture, up to more and more cellular level and more and more macroscopic levels, neurons and uh, the whole regions of the brain and the, the whole brain. So level by level, we model computationally behavior of different uh, layers in the brain or different touch systems of the brain. There are um, studies in human connectome which are on the level of neurons. So that's the project to understand how neurons are connected in the brain. And there is also a project in Europe, that, that project of connectome is the US project, that there is also a, a human uh, brain project in Europe, which is a huge future pro project on uh, computational modeling of the brain. And that there are uh, corresponding projects in, in Japan and, and the US as well. So brain is the, the, the object in the world which is so complex, but it is very, very uh, well suited for study of complexity, complex systems. It has all the, all the uh, characteristics that we already mentioned before of complex systems. And uh, we don't know enough about the details of the function of the brain and the connection between the brain and the mind and the intelligence and so on. So it's, it's very exciting research going on and uh, in, in the approach of infocomputationalism, understanding of such complex systems is uh, obtained by connecting three basic uh, ideas or three basic phenomena which affect each other. It's information as a structure, computation as a dynamic of the structure, and cognition, which is a process in an agent that results from the previous two. So we always, when we analyze the system, we have an agent who is making observation or conclusions, reasoning about the observations. So if we go to uh, the next slide, it is slide 29. What is uh, the, the most important idea of this approach, of this framework, based on information, computation, and cognition, is that based on agency, based on agency, who is Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. I, I have to do because uh, yes. for, for me page uh, thirty 
it, it, it starts saying uh, uh, information computation cognition, so it's summary of the info computational framework. Maybe that is a little, uh, a little different. Yes, yes, yes. So your 29, your page 29, what does it say? Yes, yes. It says the same, information computation and cognition, agency-based hierarchies of methods. Short summary. So I'm just uh, telling the story around. Okay. Yeah. yeah. For us, for us. And how much time do I? No, it's okay. No, but for us, this is page 30. Ah, okay. Okay. Okay, but no problem. <laughs> we will see. Okay. Okay. In any, any, any uh, uh, case, uh, this idea of information computation and cognition is used to connect the basic physical levels of information as a structure with the dynamics of information and the cognition, which is a process going on in living agents. As for now, even though people are constructing cognitive computational uh, devices, both cognitive programs, computation, and cognitive ro robotics, cognitive robots, but as for now, it is only human, or, or it is only living beings. Any any living uh, organism possesses some degree of cognition, and human humans are the most uh, complex living organisms possess uh, who possess the, the most complex level of cognition. A cognition is uh, analyzed as a process going on in every single living organism. So that was the, the, the short interlude about uh, cognition, information, computation, and cognition, and why uh, we can use computation, even though when we think about computation, we, we think about computation or calculation of the function. But in the more general sense of dynamics of information, computation can be used for describing much more complex systems than what could be used, uh, what could be done with the uh, symbolic computation, which is the, the, the traditional or uh, typical idea of computation. So I will shortly uh, move to the slide 31, which, which says essentially the same thing. Cognition consists of all info computational, so which combines structure and dynamics processes necessary to keep living agents' organization and integrity on all different levels of existence. So cognition is info computation, and cognition is equivalent with the process of life. That's uh, according to Matrana and Varela, uh, Chicago School of Cognitive Science. They were the per first person persons to, to uh, argue for cognition and the process of living. So, that was the, the short uh, increment talk about computation information cognition. And now back to the idea of social system and the, the application of uh, approach, computational approaches to social systems, which are uh, in this case, sitting as a complex system. Because of the title of the workshop, I, I'm looking uh, specifically in sitting as a complex system. And here I have uh, some references to books, uh, specifically by Michael Batty, uh, which uh, address the city as a, as a complex system, as a network of networks, and uh, it's very interesting because we are used to planning of cities or thinking analysis of cities from the top-down level and centralized planning uh, approach. But this is a completely different bottom-up approach, and if we really want to design cities bottom-up, we must understand how those processes go on when you have many agents interacting and uh, you get the completely emergent properties 
of the whole system. So I can uh, recommend this uh, research on science of cities, which is based on uh, system science and uh, complex systems and networks uh, science, and it gives us completely new approaches to the phenomenon of city. Uh, bottom up, as I said. So that's the first book and the second book, uh, City as Complex System, Cities and Complexity. Uh, they they uh, contain the analysis on many scales, from the scales of the street to patterns and structure at the scale of ur urban uh, planning and region planning and includes typical concepts of uh, criticality, threshold, surprise, novelty, phase transitions uh, in, in this context of city development. So it is, for me, it is obvious that uh, computing and computational approaches have a lot to, uh, to contribute to our understanding of possibilities, of possible scenarios for the development of different levels of or different aspects of uh, social systems, complex social systems. There is one more uh, reference that I can recommend, and uh, it's a new model for urban scale. And again, uh, the discovery of uh, scale independence and different other laws of uh, network behavior is very valuable in analysis of behavior of cities, for example. So, if we move to the next slide, this is just an example of four simple assumptions of this model, uh, which, which are surprisingly uh, effective, which work surprisingly well. So, so the four, four uh, simple assumptions of better model are mixing population, so the city develops so that the citizen can explore it fully given the resources on their disposal. The second is incremental network growth, so this assumption requires infrastructure networks develop gradually to connect people. Three is human effort is bounded, so it's very important to take into account our bounded resources. As city grows, our ability to deal with it can't increase beyond some limit. We have uh, limited resources. And the fourth is social economic outputs are proportional to local social interactions. And from this perspective, cities are concentrations, not just of people, but of interact of social social uh, interactions, which are very uh, central. So this is, this is a research recently done in the 2011, 12, 13, showing that we really have some tools, computational tools, that we can use to analyze social systems and technological systems and cities, among others, uh, and to better understand what are the possibilities and what are the consequences of different sorts of uh, strategies or policies or changes that could be made in uh, social systems, such as the city. And so to uh, finish this presentation, I would like to say a word of caution uh, in using computational models. Uh, those are really uh, excellent tools. Computational models are excellent tools for thought, but they cannot replace uh, judgment and value. Uh, so, so, so when we use computational tools, we use them as a, as, as, as a way of uh, listing all possible scenarios and seeing what under certain conditions, what things could happen. They can help us think. They, they can help us augment our intuitions about big systems and about 
time development of complex systems. But uh, human judgment is always necessary in the end. So people can easily get the feeling that this uh, simulation actually is the city. I think it's not. It, it's, it's made under certain conditions, it's simplified, it's always just a hint about what could happen. And the, 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 the last word must be human, and it must be uh, judgment based on ethical and other, other cons considerations. So, uh, let me end with a list of uh, literature which is uh, broader than only agent-based models or uh, network models or social computing. Uh, those are on computing nature in general. So those are the models about how, how, how to describe uh, and uh, simulate and uh, predict, uh, in, in a sense, uh, behaviors of, of different natural systems on different scales, on different levels of abstraction. And uh, the first book that I recommend is The Computable Universe which is edited by Ecto Stanger, uh, with the introduction by Roger Penrose. Then there are uh, three uh, books that I edited together with uh, Susan Stewart, uh, Mark Bergen, and uh, Rafaela Giovanni. And uh, they are specifically about information and computation. The, the first one includes even complete cognition and uh, the, the, the newest one, the, the one called uh, Computing Net Nature, which, which was uh, published last year, is really about the whole of nature understood as a computational network of networks. So, and the last slide is based on following articles, the list of articles. And I will add that you will find all uh, the uh, materials and uh, my presentations and my papers on my web page. So the link of the web page is given on the first slide. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm.